Hello again, everyone. Welcome back to the Best Darn Diddly Review Show. This is a weekly podcast for anyone who loves The Simpsons or ever has loved The Simpsons, hosted by two dudes that grew up on The Simpsons. My name is Miles, better known as Mr. Most Days Off, and today we're doing something for the first time in Season 9. Well, we're talking about this episode for the first time ever, but we're also finally having a guest on. It's been a while since Richie and I have been able to schedule time for a guest, so we're going to move through our intro real quick so we can get to her. Joining me, as always, your co-host with the most, Richie the Whiz Kid. How you doing, Rich? This is exciting, a guest on a really good episode, so this is going to be fun to see where the uh, road takes us here. But you said it yourself, we got no time to lose. I'll throw it back to you, the man, the myth, the unbeliever. It is Miles. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Yes, we are talking about uh, a very super cash uh, (laughs) conversation starter here today. Uh, No, but we have an awesome guest, another friend of mine from the comedy world, the improv comedy world, uh, someone I met at Dallas Comedy House and whose husband has been on the past. We're so excited to have her on today. Welcome to the show. It's Sunny Allison. How are you today, Sunny? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. Very excited to have you on the show. Uh, We had a great conversation with your husband, David, a few seasons ago, uh, and we've been talking ever since that time, essentially, about trying to schedule you here yourself, and you're here, and we're very excited to do so. And we always start the same way when we have new guests, and that is just simply, I would like to know a little bit about you, and specifically your connection to The Simpsons and what it means to you. It is a surprisingly emotional, pivotal, pivotal show for my development. Growing up, my family had kind of terrifyingly similar uh, dynamic. Uh, my parents very much mirror uh, Homer and Marge. My mom's the martyr. She uh, had an interesting relationship in that regard. And I have an older brother, a sister, and then me. And oh, you're the Maggie. Uh, Yeah. And then as I got older, I became very much the Lisa. Mm -hmm. Um, Around the time that this episode came out in, I think it was 97, I was 11 years old and I was a Buddhist vegetarian. (laughs) And like very much like my whole childhood in a lot of ways mirrored her. I was a little bit more of a bad girl than Lisa, but... Fascinating. So we're very much in the same age uh, range right there. That's hilarious, though, because we definitely have a different uh, connection to the show. I was not Buddhist or vegetarian, but I I think that's so fun just to (laughs) consider. Though I also like the idea of you just staying the Maggie and like you just got on the show and like sucked on a pacifier the entire time. (laughs) (laughs) I think I had a little bit more to say, but (laughs) maybe too much. Very cool. No, Lisa, it was it was very weird because growing up, I didn't see, you know, a lot of people that I related to on TV. And it was just bizarre that this cartoon I'd grown up watching, we watched every Sunday after church with the family, that as I grew, it grew to be so, you know, have such a similar experience to my own. That's also very fitting for this episode, just the dichotomy there of like, as a family, you would go to church and then you would go to the church of Springfield right afterwards. That very much yeah. fits kind of the <laughs> themes of this uh, of this episode we're going to discuss today. I see what you did there. <laughs> uh, something uh, you said there that I thought was uh, interesting is you said that you were a little bit of like a bad girl, Lisa. And I was actually going to say we're, we're very close to the same age since you just announced it. And I was very much kind of a not quite as mischievous Bart. So, you know, we're, we're I guess we just found ourselves on the spectrum there. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. I think we all fall somewhere between a Bart and a Lisa. Makes sense. I mean, they are they are kind of the polar opposites in so many in so many different ways, For which sure. is why it's so much fun uh when we get to see episodes when they come together, but uh, another thing I'd really love to know is uh, I gave you a, you know, I, I asked you to look over season nine and, and tell me what some of your favorite episodes from the seasons were. And this was one of the ones that you chose. Uh, what is it about Lisa the Skeptic that drew you to want to talk about this episode today? Uh, so I, I'm i a little different than a lot of uh, like the Simpsons fans that I talk to. And that I love, I just love hard episodes. I, uh, anything really the Lisa and Marge relationship for me, it just... 
it's 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 very personal. So that is one that, yeah, I I don't know. I I still cry every time I watch. I watched it multiple times leading up to this, and I cried every time. For some reason, it just it really gets me. Well, in terms of a Marge and Lisa uh, moment, this is one of the most precious ones, I would say, in a lot of ways, just Mm -hmm. because it hits on so many levels of like to the core of who both Lisa and Marge are as people. So that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, absolutely. They do a good job of putting just a little bit of tension in the relationship towards the end of the episode. And put a lot of weight on Lisa's shoulders and then like the ending on this one. Yeah, the ending gets you. I I wrote down, I've always enjoyed the ending to this episode at the moment between the two of them. Sure. Yeah, I I really like too, like you just said, they kind of build that tension. Like there's a moment specifically where Marge, you can, you can really feel the emotion in her voice as a, as Julie Kavner is delivering the lines where she talks about like, Lisa, I really wish that we could, you know, get rid of this tension before tonight. And then Lisa still continues to kind of like keep her foot down and say like, no, nothing's going to happen. This is all ridiculous. But like, I, I can definitely sense the emotional weight that Marge is expressing in that moment. And then of course, uh, we'll just talk about it. Everyone that's listening to this has seen this episode. The, the, <laughs> the squeeze thing, like, you know, the, oh, you were squeezing yes. me pretty tight. And then she tries to, like, for just a moment, she tries to deflect and immediately is like, oh, thanks for squeezing back, mom. Mm-hmm. Like, how does that not get you? Well, and the other thing about it, too, is they do a good job of showing two sides of the same coin, so to speak, and yet they find common ground in a sort of way. So I, I always enjoy the way they tied that one up. Well, I think yeah. they did a... For a, me... A, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I was just going to say that... Um, oh, I lost it. I'm sorry. It's good. Jump <laughs> good right job, in. Miles. <laughs> I'll yeah, get my back fault. to it. I'll take Oh, I'll later. remember. <laughs> yeah, jump right in with it if you do think of it, by all means. Uh, I was just going to say, on that ending, it's actually uh, interesting. One of the few things I have from the director's commentary on this one, which this was another very full director's commentary. It had showrunner Mike Scully, Pete Michaels, who was not the director of this episode, but just happened to be around for the uh, commentary and decided to jump in. Yardley Smith, the voice of Lisa uh, Simpson, George Meyer, David X. Cohen, who actually penned the original idea for this. Uh, he didn't write the entire script, but it was his concept that he came up with, which makes a lot of sense. Uh, knowing what we know about David X. Cohen and his scientific uh, background and moving on to Futurama and all that. Uh, and then, of course, Matt Groening, who tends to be around for a lot of these commentaries. I think he's associated with the show somehow. I can't remember. <laughs> but uh, one of the few things I have to talk about at the end is actually directly tied into the ending. Uh, but you know what? We like to tease things here, so we will save that for the very end. We'll go ahead and start from the beginning for right now. Uh, we are talking Whoa. about Lisa the Skeptic, which originally aired on November 23rd, 1997. We get the chalkboard gag on this one that says, I will not tease Fatty. I'm not sure if he's referring to <laughs> Homer or Martin or who on that one, but either way. Uh, the couch gag, Uter, that would make sense to you. Uh, the couch gag, I actually think is really funny. Uh, the Simpsons <laughs> run into their living room, which is essentially a sauna at this point with three men in towels who kind of stare them down until the Simpsons leave embarrassed, it would seem. Yeah, that one, uh, I didn't remember that one, but I enjoyed that one. <laughs> the awkward family reaction is wonderful. Yeah. And we start out the episode with a police sting, actually. It's a pretty funny bit. And apparently, from the commentary, they did say that this came from the fact that they really did this pretty frequently at this time in the uh, areas around California where they would live. Like, somehow, they would post these ridiculous things that people would actually be dumb enough to fall for and essentially turn themselves in uh, for various petty crimes. Uh, In this case, Homer thinks he's getting a free boat. Uh, only when he arrives, it turns out that the police are, like I said, basically just setting people up, uh, for Homer's sake, it's to pay $175 worth of tickets. Uh, I don't know exactly what Snake did, but they both seem to get roughed up pretty well by the cops for this. And we know that Homer and Snake are going to have some police interaction here and over the next few episodes, so uh, they just keep going back to this well, I guess, this season. 
Oh, that's right. We're recording this out of order. Uh, we wanted to accommodate our I schedules. was trying to hide that fact. Uh, I, I, I I forgot, <laughs> so I'm just going to own up to it right now. What episode is it that's coming up? Is it Realty Bites? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, we have that one coming up in a couple weeks. And yeah, you're you're totally right. Maybe their beef started here. Maybe so. This is where Homer first got an eye for that car. And Snake just actually gets put in jail at this time so that when he's in jail when the car is being sold to pay off Snake's supposed debt. It all makes sense. I think it works out best for uh, Homer anyway, as they say that the happiest days of a boat owner's life is the first one is the day he buys it and the other one is the day he sells it. So maybe uh, maybe it worked out. I do like, though, how like cocky uh, Wiggum is about this whole thing. Oh, and I also really love the uh, ignorance of the rest of the family. Well, you can kind of see Marge knows something's up, but like as they're driving home boatless, Bart's just in the back seat poking at home or making it so much worse. Like, where's our boat? Why are you so mad? Why haven't you said anything? <laughs> I really I love the song. Oh, sorry. No, go no, ahead. Sorry. I really love the song that he, uh, the song he sings as they're driving up. It's by uh, the Fifth Dimension, the... Up, up, and away in my beautiful balloon. <laughs> He's like on it's cloud nine. It's such a weird song. <laughs> yeah, but he, it's yeah, such a happy he, song. Yeah, he got the dream of the boat, and that's what's that's what's most important. It's Those better are... than the boat would have ever been, but he did want <laughs> yeah. a yellow boat with extra motors. The drive up there is actually probably the best part of his day, just thinking he's about to be a boat owner, and also not $175 uh, poorer than he was when he arrived. So what, like, that's really cheap tickets. Didn't they say he had, like... 235 unpaid tickets, and it's only $175. Just think of Miles when we lived in, in Denton, going to the UNT parking office, where you have, like, four tickets, and it's, like, $300. Yeah, I can't really park anywhere in Denton anymore, but no. Um... <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, just, okay. at the, just at the campus, specifically. It's fine. Just at the second save. That doesn't exist anymore, bro. <gasps> that was bought out by UNT a few years ago, but that's neither here they nor there. It too? Oh my gosh. <laughs> they own, I can't they park own anywhere. everything now, man. <laughs> it's kind of crazy. I I think that like eventually TWU and UNT are just going to merge into like become Denton and that will be it. Like that in a Walmart. And, and, yeah. and they're really sick. Uh, like honestly, Denton is also way cooler than it was when we lived there because uh, it's got like the square now and all sorts of stuff. But anyone who doesn't live in the North Texas area listening to this is like Denton who? Yeah, <laughs> we don't care. <laughs> oh, man. So uh, I also do like to Lisa keeps calling Homer out on the way home because I think Homer says like there is something wrong with the mast is why uh, why he doesn't it have the termites. Boat. Why, why would a motorboat have a mast? <laughs> because the thing he was shut up. <laughs> Homer's response <laughs> to everything. He also even asked for his motorboat after he uh, already got beat up and got the tickets. He's like, all right, fine. I paid. Now, can I please have my motorboat? <laughs> oh, and he's so excited when they will see it on TV. And he's like, oh, I'd watch that. <laughs> <laughs> So on the way home, though, for the plot purpose of this episode, it seems that <laughs> the entire point of all of that was to get the Simpsons to drive by a construction site for a brand new mall. Hey, they can't just build a parking lot on Sabretooth Meadow. That's where they found all them fossils. Pfft, fossils, mossels. You can't stop progress because of some moany old bones. Bones, moans. <laughs> <laughs> So Lisa's they, upset, of course, because they might be paving over specimens and no one else really seems to care. Uh, this is a really fun Lisa moment, too. Fun in a sad way, I guess, but fun in like a Lisa way, just because, again, knowing that Lisa represents the voice of the audience, the fact that she's like, who wants to complain with me? Come on, somebody, come on, crickets. complain with me. All right, fine, I'll come back later. Who wants to come back with me? Crickets. Fine. But she does go back, Miles. That's true. With uh, her attorney, actually. Lionel Which, Hutz. <laughs> this this is when I realized we were recording out of order. When <laughs> when Hutz started speaking, I was like, wait a minute. Oh, yeah. It's before uh, Realty Bites. Yeah, so we learn in Realty Bites that Lionel Hutz's last speaking... That's Lionel Hutz's last speaking role before the tragedy uh, occurs to Phil Hartman. But, uh... 
That was actually kind of interesting because on the commentary on this one, I think it was David X. Cohen referred to this episode being the last episode that Lionel Hutz uh, spoke in. I'm wondering if maybe this was the production, like maybe Realty Bites was actually ran out of production because they do that sometimes. I don't really know. He could have also just got it mixed up. Maybe they did them out of order like we are. That would be fun if they did, especially if it was in like the exact same order. Yeah. <laughs> so the construction crew or like the landowners or the whoever's it is they assure lisa and her lawyer that there are no fossils here because the museum dug them all up years ago <laughs> well my attorney lionel hutz calls your attention in the municipal code 147 c protection of antiquities and fossils <laughs> and he opens up his briefcase, but there's just an apple core and a sandwich in it. <laughs> <laughs> Good old Lionel Hutz. The beautiful moment. And that's when they say the museum got all of them, and Lisa says, but what if they miss something? You have to allow an archaeological survey. Oh, yeah? Who's going to make us? You? <laughs> <laughs> and then and Lionel Hutz starts laughing. <laughs> <laughs> Oh like, man, harder than you guys are. <laughs> yeah, he's doing the thing like when you tell a, like back in like the day if you like told a joke and someone clearly doesn't get it and they're trying to like pretend like they totally do. <laughs> that's Hutz right there, man. Oh, I'm gonna miss him. Um, they have an idea though. The uh, people behind the construction, they're like, "Oh man, wait, this could be a good publicity i something," and they kind of walk away uh, and tell tell Lisa she's free to dig. Fine, we'll see you in court. Mr. Hutz, we won. We? <laughs> Boxing Lisa out, man. That's awful. But that was a very key plot point there. <laughs> yeah, you're right. That's actually interesting that they uh, they have that line right there. And until we read over the script, really, you don't think much about it. But like, it totally tells the ending of the episode in a roundabout yep. way. Yeah. It's very subtle. I didn't I didn't notice it the first couple times I watched it and then yeah, that last time I saw it, I was like, Oh they Wait did, yeah, they gave second. the whole thing away. Which is really cool. I like it actually a lot, especially if you have any sort of like mystery element to the show. Uh I really enjoy it when it actually makes sense and it's solvable. Not yeah. in a like a who shot Mr. Burns way, but more in a like the um the what was it? the message or the note the torn the torn uh picture from the this one where uh, homer better. becomes the town crier yes yeah kind of class lisa yeah 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 that's the one really uh yeah those, those types of mysteries are the ones that i find really really fun especially when they make the clues like add up uh, they make an announcement the next day at the Springfield Elementary School that all honor students will be rewarded with a trip to an archaeological dig. Yay! Conversely, all detention students will be punished with a trip to an archaeological dig. Ooh. <laughs> I like that Lisa I'll... calls in her favor in the office. Yeah. Gonna... <laughs> Oh we yeah, got a the scorpion, scorpion in the applesauce. <laughs> <laughs> I knew this day would come. We're not going to tell anybody <laughs> about that, right? Uh, we see like this kind of uh, basically the bullies are treating this archaeological dig as if it were prison. They're wearing jumpsuits <laughs> and they're even singing a little song. Jimbo's kind of the uh, the ringleader. Gonna dig me a hole. Gonna dig me a hole. Gonna put a nerd in it. Gonna put a nerd in it. Gonna take a firecracker. Gonna take a firecracker. <laughs> what are they gonna do with that firecracker, Richie? That's why they didn't write a fourth line to the song. Yeah, that's the bit, of course, man. <laughs> yeah, that's terrifying. I'll... I had a firecracker go off in my finger once, and that was bad enough, and I have a feeling that's not where they were planning on putting it. You used to hit firecrackers at me with a golf club. Yeah, that sounds right. <laughs> <laughs> I love Ralph in this scene. Oh my gosh, yes. It's uh, some choice. He's got a lot of really good quotes in this episode. He's He comes in and just does so many little like 
one-liner bits that are, I mean, you know, just one, literally one line, and they're hilarious. Uh, it, <clears throat> excuse me. And even Yardley Smith on the uh, commentary mentioned that she was actually just randomly watching this episode with her husband at one point, and, like, her husband, like, fell out of, ba- uh, out of bed laughing at one of the Ralph lines in this episode. <laughs> <laughs> I like the bit with Skinner where he's so excited about digging for fossils and he's like, oh, this appears to be some sort of rock. Oh, no, it's just a clump of dirt. Even so, my heart is pounding like a kettle drum. <laughs> like, <laughs> I better sit down. So for a while. excited. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Ralph actually gets excited here and comes up to Principal Skippy, Principal Skipster. I found something. It's a spearhead. That's your trowel blade, Ralph. Fell off the handle. And I found it. <laughs> he's so excited. Like, honestly, he's just genuinely oh, happy. Oh, Skipple. <laughs> uh, so Skinner's trying to encourage them all to be back to work. Um, later on, we actually see that Bart and Milhouse are even getting in on the fun. They're definitely digging up dirt. But, unfortunately, they are putting it in Martin's pants, who is sound asleep on the site. (laughs) That's what you get for sleeping on the job. Yep. Uh, Principal Skinner's actually ready to call it for a day, but Lisa is, like, just desperately holding on to find anything that could be considered important. And, of course, just as if it were needed on cue to keep this story going... She finds just that, though it wasn't something small. It was, uh, she even yells out, she like needs to find something odd, like a skeleton. Uh, and then, of course, that's exactly what she has found right when everybody shows up. Ooh. I noticed that Ruth Powers makes a lot of cameos in this episode. Oh, nice. They do yeah, talk about She always seems something. to be in the background. They, they did actually actively talk about that a little bit on the commentary. They did not mention Ruth specifically, but they said that they do make an effort to always try to populate the background scenes with reoccurring, like, residents of Springfield to, like, make it feel like a real town. So uh, that's awesome that you happen to notice Ruth. They also have Manjula a lot in this episode, considering that her and Apu just got married, which I thought was interesting. Oh, yeah, that would actually have been just the last episode. Yep. I guess that kind of makes sense that she would be fresh on the mind, though. Yeah, but I, I like that they try to keep little bits of continuity going. Yeah, 100%. Uh, Lisa and Dr. Hibbert are actually examining this skeleton, and Hibbert's medical opinion is, that ain't right. <laughs> <laughs> From the looks of it, I'd say this fellow died from causes unknown. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So they continue to dust off the bones, and they they actually did a really great job. They complimented him on the uh, commentary as well about how how well the animation department did at making this feel like they were treating it like a real fossil in terms of like the brushing techniques and the way that it was Mm -hmm. uncovered. Uh, It's pretty cool to see, but what it looks like is a human skeleton with wings. And of course, Mm -hmm. Ned Flanders knows that must be an angel. Well, obviously that is impossible. Yeah, Lisa's right. It's an angel. (laughs) (laughs) Good old Mo. Mo has a couple of really great lines in here too. If uh oh man, it's uh what is it? If you're not gonna tell us what it is and or what it ain't, tell us what it am. I think we're, we're gonna get yeah, to it here soon. It's like <laughs> two lines away. Yeah, yeah. That was actually the end of the first act, and we open up the second act with Lisa defending the fact that it can't be an angel. No. Well, if you're so sure what it ain't, how about telling us what it am? Oh yeah, I totally spoiled that one. Yeah. <laughs> It was just around the corner, and I got so impatient. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a damn good line. It's so fun. Yeah, I love the. I don't know the. Tell us what it am. Uh, but yeah, the crowd is needing or demanding an instant explanation, and Lisa tries to uh, kind of reason the idea that y- you know science takes time, I guess. But she does actually uh, make an attempt. To say that it could have been like a uh, evolution. She talks about evolution and whatnot. She says that like two giant fish leap up and bite some Neanderthal's arms. That's and then what they it all. Was. He <laughs> runs out of the water with the fish stuck to his arms. And then he like 
dies basically. That could have been the fish would have been the wings. Yeah. I read a really good AV Club article about um, how this episode is really just about Lisa realizing the fall- the fallibility of adults and how just, you know, everyone kind of fails her in this episode. She uh, It's just looking for answers and looking to be open about it and everyone's just shutting her down and, you know, well, if it's not what we're saying, what is it? Tell us exactly what it is. They're just putting this onus on this poor little eight-year-old. <laughs> Well, that's oh, go ahead, Rich. I was, I was gonna say that's like I still remember the first time I watched this episode. Like I remember the commercials leading up to it. I remember like this. You have like this inquisitive and astonished feel while you're watching this episode. Like you want to solve what is going on, but you're like, I mean, it, it it's an angel. It looks like an angel. But it's got wings. Like how the heck are they gonna explain this? And I just remember like even rewatching it you have that feeling when she's first digging it up where you're just like, oh my gosh, I want to solve this so bad. And it just makes you kind of shake your head. But this episode definitely makes you feel a lot of those feelings. Like, I think archaeology is kind of cool, actually. So that made me like this one a lot more. Well, this was in a post-Jurassic Park world. So archaeology got way cooler about five years prior to this. Or like four or five years prior to this, whatever it was, yeah. Uh, I also think that this uh, this episode is interesting. It's a little bit different, but I, I remember around this time there was a hysteria of like things like a Dorito that was shaped like Jesus that would like sell on eBay for a ridiculous amount of money, or you know, silly things like that that uh, people are so quick to buy into. And I think this is definitely more of a, a this is, I didn't mean to like necessarily tie those two directly together. Cause this is definitely something <laughs> that is more, but like the, I just meant like the hysteria aspect of it. Like it's almost like yeah. it's a, um, it's almost like it's uh, like, contagious. I need to rub my foot on the Dorito. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm having foot surgery. Let me get some of that cheese dust on my toes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Oh, man. So uh, Lisa's still trying to say it, it could be anything. <laughs> it could be a mutant even from the nuclear plan. No, oh, fiddle faddle. Everyone knows our mutants have flippers. <laughs> oh, I've said too much. Smithers, use the amnesia ray. Do you mean the revolver, sir? <laughs> Precisely. <laughs> be sure to wipe your own memory clear when you've finished. No. <laughs> 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 that is that is one of the darkest jokes that we've seen in a Simpsons episode since the Dave Merkin era. Was this Postman in Black though? Uh, you, that's a good. Was this Postman in Black? I don't know. I like, think Men in Black was ninety eight. That's what I'm thinking too. But now I have to know because that, like that's where I'm thinking the amnesia ray thing came from. Uh, I mean, that would make a lot of sense that it would be fresh in the pop culture mind if that were the case. I'm Googling it now to see what 1997. Ever... So it was right Ooh. at this. I just don't know when in 1997. And it was summer before. It was it came out July 2nd, and that episode came out. I mean, they would have made November. it around the same time, but it came out in November, yeah. Okay, so, right on. So, so, it yeah, checks am- out. Amnesia Ray referencing the men in black and also suicide. Um, you, both yes. must have used, <laughs> you both must have used uh, Burns' Amnesia Ray before <laughs> recording this episode. Yikes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, so I lost my place in the script. Someone else. <laughs> we just in. talked about Burns and Smithers, but I did enjoy Wiggum's line before where he's like, "Everybody's heard of angels, but who's heard of a Neanderthal?" <laughs> 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 uh, but immediately too, uh, there's another aspect of this that we haven't talked about. Of course, there's going to be certain members of Springfield that are going to heavily dive into the religious aspects that angels imply uh and that would include ned flanders and reverend lovejoy in that order <laughs> well mel wants I to hear from ned, Lionel Hutz. But... <laughs> <laughs> oh uh yeah lionel hutz has does have a great line you're right they have to refer to the legal authority in the case Finders versus keepers. <laughs> At least he can cite one case. That's a, and that's a, a super important one that's made a lot of important impact on our judicial uh, judicial system throughout the years. There he is. Yeah, nailed it. Uh, 
<laughs> oh, we can work this out, friends. In the spirit of sharing, why don't we simply place the sacred bones? Honk, honk. Homer just uh, grabs the angel and runs off. That's Finders Keepers. Oh, long suckers. I do actually uh, really like has that. A, uh, no, go ahead. Sorry, she said Hepper has a really funny little monologue in there, too, about, well, I think in my professional opinion, he should just, it should be me. I should take him. <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. He's uh, using that professional opinion of his to imply he's uh, needing that. But uh, I, I love that Homer actually does exactly what Homer would do in any of these situations, and that's just simply yoink. I mean, Hutz gave him the clear. He said, finders versus keepers. Lisa found it. So Homer keeper. Yeah. So Homer takes it and actually decides he's going to put it in a safe deposit box with his other valuables and uh, just leave it in there so it'll appreciate in value. <laughs> it's probably it a million a years old, Dad. Trove. Yeah. yeah, it is. Uh, do you Did you notice any items you want to talk about? Uh, I saw there was the... The town crier hat from the Iconoclast episode. Nice. Um, Mr. Plow's jacket. There are some heads from, uh, robot heads from Itchy and Scratchy Land. How do you smuggle those out? (laughs) Oh, I paused it. I took a good look. (laughs) Yeah, it is. I mean, there are so many different things in there. I had to look some of it up because I didn't know what everything was. Oh, yeah, 100%. Uh, You Mm -hmm. you did far better than I would have had without cheating. Uh, But I did did cheat. (laughs) IMDB, and you're right, Mr. Plow Jacket, the box of Mr. Sparkle, the robot heads from Itchy and Scratchy Land, which is fantastic, his astronaut helmet, because yeah. they laughed about the fact that this show is now in season nine, and somehow Homer's already been to space, like, halfway through this se- uh, through this uh, series at this point. Uh, he also has won a Grammy, which was in there. He's got boxing gloves from that time where he got real close to death. Uh, one of the many times, I should say. A cowboy hat when he was the uh, country star's manager. And you said it, the town crier, both the hat and the bell. Lots hear of goodies you, in there. You. I love when they do stuff like this. I think it's great. I, I also love that we constantly see like the tiki head in the basement, things like that. Like Those, uh, those type of callbacks make me really appreciate the show more. Yeah. Agreed. Also uh, kind of ruins the theory a little bit where everything's happening all at the same time in different universes. Um, yeah, I guess that's I mean, probably true. It's... And also or... it puts some, some emphasis on which order the show is in because if like, you know, some people just think it runs entirely out of order. Yep. And obviously this episode has to happen after all of those episodes, but that's still a lot of like fluctuation with a possible timeline. Yeah. And then, like, especially when you tie in Back to the Future and The Simpsons, which, like, they are officially connected at Universal Studios, like, then you can really start playing with, like, how did all of this happen? Miles, Avengers Endgame approved that Back to the Future is total garbage on time traveling. Oh, that's true. That's true. It totally <laughs> it, it put it in its place, finally, after all these years. That's what we really need. We need more <laughs> angels. This is uh, where Sonny was talking about earlier. We see it back at the Simpsons' home when they're watching TV. Uh, they, they talk about that hilarious giveaway scam that Homer is so excited to watch. But then the doorbell rings, and this is where uh, we see Ned Flanders for the second time trying to get the uh, time with the angel. Hey there, March. Just brought the kids over to share a prayer with the angel if it's all right with you. And Homer interrupts, get your own angel, you moocher. Thanks anyway, Homer. (sighs) Homer is, I'm sorry, Ned Flanders is always just so nice, even when um, Homer is a complete douche. But it doesn't sound He is a little pushier in this episode, though. Like, I feel like this is maybe the harshest Ned is at times, outside of his, you know, more explosive episodes. Yeah, I mean, he stands his ground, I guess, when it comes to his faith and uh, his, you know, desire to connect with this holy relic. And it makes sense, because that would be the highest stakes for Flanders' character. Mm Mm-hmm. And the least holy person that he knows has it, so there's probably a lot of tension there. Unspoken. That makes Mm -hmm. sense. 
Uh, we see another visitor as it's Agnes this time. Sorry to trouble you, but I'm going to surgery tomorrow, and I wondered if I could rub the angel with my foot for good luck. It's foot surgery. I'm trying to eat it here. Beat it, peg leg. <laughs> Jackass. <laughs> then oh, there's so much Marge. Agnes. <laughs> I, I love that one. <laughs> Jackass and looks back at Marge and is so polite. <laughs> <laughs> She's got a little bit of a Jekyll and Hyde thing going there, but it's all her. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and uh, did you notice the the continuity issue with Agnes later in the episode? Mm-mm. She's supposed to be having foot surgery, but at the end of the episode, she is the first one, according to IMDb, running down the hill towards the mall. Well, oh, for the mall, not for the religious aspect. Okay, that's, yeah. that's funny. So if she just had foot surgery... I mean, that means she recovered in like a day. Maybe she had a really good surgeon. Dr. Nick? <laughs> or, I mean, if the world's ending, why do you need to get your foot fixed? That's a good That's... point, too, yeah. Uh, she just canceled the appointment, because who needs it? Uh, but wouldn't but, her foot Richie, still hurt? Did you notice Miles? the con- Maybe. But did you notice <laughs> the continuity issue where Marge closes the door and it was just Agnes outside and then seconds later she opens it again to see it's the entire town? They're all very <laughs> good ninjas that snuck to the door after it closed. They were all on top of the roof waiting. We want to see your angel. Come on, Homer. I just want a quick look-see. Pay you a buck. A buck, eh? That gives me an idea. <laughs> And we see uh, this big complex, like, cut through of the garage where Homer's making a, a, like, museum display for the angel. But instead of raising prices, he boldly announces, 50 cents, please. Means he's got to have change to take people's bucks and give them 50 cents back. Why? He made a lot more work, and also he doesn't have a lot of longevity in this business, I would guess. (laughs) Uh, I like the song that's playing there, too. It's, uh... Very quickly made, you can tell. Here's the angel. See the angel. It's my angel. No one else's. Next to the rakes. <laughs> Lisa is immediately the moral voice of the episode again when she uh, points out that it's not okay, it's not fair to claim it's an angel if you have no proof of that. No one's calling it an angel, Lisa. If you look carefully, I never once used the word angel. And they're standing directly next to a giant banner that says angel and points right over to the angel. Uh, Homer declares, that's a typo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, then Lisa has the sensible thing to do where she wants to take a bone to go get it checked out to see what it actually is. Oh, no, 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 no. We could lose out on bags of money. It's sacrilegious, I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> But Lisa takes it into her own hands, in this case, the toe of the supposed angel, uh, to go and get it scientifically checked out herself. And she walks into the lab of none other than Stephen J. Gould, who is apparently a famous scientist. Yeah, I never knew who he was. I, however, did not remember the giant whale moment. (laughs) <laughs> like I completely forgot that moment where you think there's a giant whale hanging at the museum um, that's a fake whale, but it's totally alive and being fed and like kind of watered and brushed. Maybe it's the one that Mo was trying to smuggle out, even though that was a killer whale. So never mind. <laughs> did they talk about Stephen Jay Gould on the commentary at all? Cause I did a Google search. I was just about to ask you if you uh, knew anything about him specifically. They did talk about him in the commentary though. In fact, uh, he apparently is known as just being a very good spe- – he's a, a very brilliant scientist, and he's a, a very funny speaker. So he's actually uh, got a very popular – or at the time, he had a very popular um, well, college then. class that people would take. And actually, uh, David X. Cohen took it, he said, just pass-fail, just for fun, just because he wanted to hear his like lectures – And it was one of those deals where he never actually got to meet or see the guy. He just saw his presentations on like a screen, but he took the class and he very much enjoyed it. Hmm. He's a paleontologist and an evolutionary biologist, as well as a historian of science. Dang. I know that his, his main theory was punctuated equilibrium, 
which is like a, for evolution, long periods of stability and then just short, rapid bursts of change. Hmm. Okay. A little interesting. Uh, I did see, too, that uh, in season 14, he passed away, and they dedicated the episode Papa's Got a Brand New Badge to him. Oh, that's sweet. He clearly meant a lot to at least David X. Cohen, and I would imagine some of the rest of the staff as well, based on that information. Yeah. I do also really like whenever uh, Lisa originally shows up with her test, like we see Gould checking it out or what we think he's checking out in a microscope. He's like, oh, my God, this is amazing. This could change everything. Oh, now let's get to what you brought in. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bone scraping from the skeleton I found. Oh, yeah, that so-called angel. The whole thing's preposterous, of course. Quite preposterous, but no one will believe me until I can prove it really what it really is. Can you do a, do a DNA test? I can talk, I swear. <laughs> Can't you do a DNA test or something? <laughs> Dr. Gould says that he can, in fact, have the results by tomorrow, but he also uh, reassures her when Lisa's like, oh, I can't pay you. He's like, well, I didn't get into science for financial gain. Whatever little money you have will be just fine. <laughs> <laughs> It would have been funny if she paid with all the uh, 50 cents in the garage. Oh, uh, a bag full of quarters. That would have actually been really funny. Uh, back at the garage in front of the angel, Carl and Lenny are actually arguing over if it's an angel of peace or an angel of mercy. But they're like calling each other like <laughs> idiots and jerks. Lisa Ex interrupts to uh, to tell them that they'll have the analysis soon and then she'll have all of the facts. You did what? Stupid. And Boo. Homer's there to reassure facts are meaningless. You can use facts to prove anything that's remotely true. Fact schmacks. I mean, he's not wrong. Ah, dude, their facts are out of control, <laughs> dude. You bring up like even in like sports where it does it happens most commonly where they find any kind of fact to like take down some random tangent to prove this is the only player that's ever done this and you're like I don't care. There's a fine line between fact and meaningless stat. Yep. Exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so when uh, Lisa's excited because Dr. Gould actually shows up and she asks, what were the results, Professor? <sighs> Inconclusive. Inconclusive? Then why did you come running up like that? Can I use your bathroom? <laughs> ah, good old potty humor. That brings us back to The Simpsons sometimes. It's a really <laughs> smart show, but we got to have those jokes to keep the balance. Balance must be maintained. Honestly, this next line by Reverend Lovejoy is probably my favorite joke in the episode. Well, it appears science has failed again in front of the overwhelming religious evidence. But go home, science girl. I am home. Good. Stay there. <laughs> and then Homer taking a uh, shot at getting some more money here. All right, folks, get your angel glow sticks. No one gets into heaven without a glow stick. Ooh, ooh, I'll take four. <laughs> Poor Flanders. Flanders. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Flanders. Uh, though, to be fair, Flanders could just be so nice. He, does, he just wants to support his buddy's business because, you know, he's a neighbor. But no, he just wants to get into heaven. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure he got fun. the glow sticks from Ned's garage. Yeah. <laughs> That's excellent. I didn't even think about that. That's so funny. I don't know why Ned would have glow sticks, but if he did. From his crazy college night many, many years ago. And I think this next scene is where the real heart of this episode lies, or at least it's where it starts, because this is our first real encounter with just Lisa and Marge. And as we mentioned earlier, uh, it gets very emotional between these two. And this is where the tension begins, because Lisa's venting her feelings. And she uh, walks into the kitchen where Marge is sitting at the table, and she says, Ugh! These morons make me feel so angry. Maybe so, but I'd appreciate it if you didn't call them morons. But they are morons. What grown person could believe in angels? Well, your mother, for one. <gasps> you? But you're an intelligent person, Mom. There has to be more to life than just what we see, Lisa. Everyone needs something to believe in. It's not that I don't have a spiritual side. I just find it hard to believe there's a dead angel hanging in our garage. Oh, 
My poor Lisa, if you can't make a leap of faith now and then, well, I feel sorry for you. Don't feel sorry for me, Mom. I feel, I feel sorry for you. And she says that last line like very defensively. Yeah, and and, and like almost like a little bit of spite in some way. Yeah, it, it very much was supposed to have venom, I think, and uh, it it makes you really feel bad uh for marge and admittedly i feel frustrated for lisa because i do identify with that but it's like that struggle of like she doesn't understand the idea that it's or like there's a there's a constant battle there it's like you don't want to like hurt anybody's feelings but it's just like come on like you can't all seriously believe that that thing in the garage is an angel like there's like is anybody even willing to consider another alternative so I guess the the question to pose here is what should have been Lisa's next step? Like uh, in the scientific community, wouldn't you take samples to like multiple archaeologists or scientists that have it? And there's just not another one in Springfield. Like how how could this have gone a different way? Well, I feel like she started with Gould and like maybe she should have worked up there. Like maybe take it to like the minor league, like, you know, paleontologist right. and – let them have a crack, or archaeologists, and let them have a crack at it. I got into Jurassic Park again there for a second. <laughs> They're birds, Miles. <laughs> I mean, it does have wings. We get another clip of uh, the TV back at the Simpsons' home, and it's Lisa who's making a record number of appearances on Kent Brockman's smart, uh, smart line. <laughs> I think it's her 13th uh, appearance. I love how she just says, Kent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get straight to it. Miss Simpson, how can you maintain your skepticism despite the fact that this thing really, really looks like an angel? I just think it's a fantasy if you believe in angels. Then why not unicorns, sea monsters, and leprechauns? <clears throat> That's a bunch of baloney. Lisa, everyone knows that leprechauns are extinct. <laughs> not true. You'll see one in a future episode of The Simpsons. And that proves that they're definitely not extinct. <laughs> maybe I'm thinking of South Park. I think it is South Park that you're thinking of, but maybe I, not. I don't know. It, it's both. Look, you can either accept science miles and face reality, or you can believe in angels and live in a childish dream world. <laughs> and then you see, um, it's a, I, are they at Ned's home or are they in the church somewhere? I'm not really I sure. They're in like the basement in the church or something. It's a group of like the religious folks of Springfield who have gathered and are watching this episode of Smart Line on TV. Science. What's science ever done for us? TV off. <laughs> science is like a blabbermouth who ruins a movie by telling you how it ends. Well, I say there are some things we don't want to know. Important things. <laughs> <laughs> enough talk it's smashing time and there's agnes again just f coming in with the killer delivery because uh they actually Wrong take place. it to the museum of natural history where in a gang-like manner they just start destroying anything scientific including uh the bones of a tyrannosaurus rex oh do, do you know i think that I don't think that Moe's necessarily religious, or I don't think that they they've shown that in the past. I think he just likes mobs. That makes sense. Yeah, you're you're absolutely right. <laughs> He's more into the mob mentality than he is any sort of like spiritual element to it. And he I likes feel to like be I've included. seen him. Yeah, yeah. I feel like I've seen him with a pitchfork a few times too. <laughs> mm. Moe definitely seems like the type that would buy into your L MLM and like display it at his bar. <laughs> <laughs> like the no these uh hangover pills totally work oh yeah he joined a cult if they'd let him was he part of the stone cutters and will Ooh. he be in a cult in a oh. few weeks yeah we have a cult episode coming yeah. up very soon we'll find out if he's into that mob as well leader <laughs> they also visit the springfield robotics lab where they're beating up all these robots and there's one that comes out crying why why was i programmed to feel pain what about the mammoth that mo hits with a club and the tusk like crushes him <laughs> oh i'm paralyzed <laughs> i hope medical science can cure me <laughs> And then a second later, he's in. He's at like the front of the mob that's attacking the robot. <laughs> he's fine. Medical science got to him quick. 
<laughs> Lisa is actually upset after watching this. She says she wished that she just never found those stupid blue, uh, stupid bones. And it's time to put an end to this. So she grabs or she asks Bart if, uh, or really tells Bart, I'm borrowing your blue crowbar. Good old Bluey. Hey, she's going to smash the angel. Somebody stop her. <laughs> but nobody actually moves. <laughs> <laughs> very, very uh, Simpsons-like. But yep. Lisa arrives in the garage where she does plan to smash that angel up, only to find that it's gone. Oh no, this can't be happening. What the hell are we going to do with 10,000 angel ashtrays? So you can see that Homer's been trying to monetize with merch, and he's got a stack of boxes of ashtrays, but fortunately, Bart is being unusually helpful. I could take up smoking. You damn well better. <laughs> Parenting 101. And that actually brings us to the end of our second act. So this is an episode that feels like the last uh, last third is going to wrap up very quickly. It does feel that way, Miles. Well, it's actually, I mean, there's still several pages of script left, but like it feels like a lot has already happened is all I'm trying to say. Yeah, like you feel like you're at the end of the tunnel, but you're like, wait, there's still more things? Right. Like, it, it, And they have very limited time to tie everything that they've set up at this point together. But they're going to do a real good job. <laughs> Unfortunately, though, uh, Lisa's not the only one that wants the angel. The mob actually shows up and declares that they also want the angel, uh, but they don't have it. It's gone. <laughs> <laughs> but before when he, homer's like okay okay don't panic marge stop panicking <laughs> so we need a replacement skeleton and we need it now bart strip down, down to your, your skeleton, skeleton. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's really good uh the crowd immediately accuses lisa of doing something to the angel which to be fair she was planning on doing no, but uh she declares no it must have been stolen Looks to me that Lisa Simpson found something that science could not explain, so she had to destroy it. And Lisa's still holding Bluey the crowbar. Uh-oh. Wiggum's right there. Well, that's all the evidence I need. Arrest the girl. Hey! What? She didn't do anything. Then Bart is... Bart's looking out for her a little bit, at least. Give her a nice cell, something in C-Block, and put some money in Wiggum's pocket. He tries to bribe her so his sister gets good treatment <laughs> in jail. <laughs> also, how well does he know the jail that he knows that C-Block is where it's at? <laughs> <laughs> they actually have uh, George, uh, I'm sorry, George, Judge Schneider looking <laughs> over the case. And I have to say, I really love the outcome that we get here. Um, they're literally trying religion versus science in court. And I think that uh, he puts a, a restraining order on either science or religion has to stay 500 feet from the other 500 yards. Are y'all me. are y'all familiar with the trial that it was based on? No, I'm not. Please it, uh, enlighten yeah. us. It was from the 20s and I listened to uh, like an NPR or something on it forever ago. And it's, uh, it's in the 1920s in like Dayton, Tennessee. It was very much orchestrated um and it was a teacher they found a teacher that would do well for this case and they were like okay he's you know he's teaching evolution and they build it was just this big huge spectacle they had you know news newscasters everywhere and um yeah it was evolution versus christianity and it was this big trial they had this huge new york lawyer come out and yeah, it's pretty fascinating if you ever read up on it. That sounds like called something called the Scopes I've... Monkey Trial. Oh, yeah, I've definitely heard of that. That's uh... yeah, Claire Darrow was the lawyer in it. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 wild. That's no, that sounds like a fascinating story. I mean, and like just how crazy you know people get to put that through our judicial system, but. Um, I wish they'd make a documentary about that. I wonder if they have. I like documentaries a lot more than I like reading. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there was like a a 1950s movie made about it that is unwatchable. That it's totally fun, scientifically yeah. sound. Yeah, <laughs> it ages great. <laughs> 
But something else is occurring here after uh, they go back and find the site of the, or they go back to where the angel is essentially found and they actually see that he's now standing upright with a message that says that uh, the end will come at sundown. Well, did it fly up there? That's what they don't know. They, they, They declare that it must have, I think. I just know Eddie, that Ralph... I'm scared. Too scared to even wet my pants. <laughs> just relax. It'll come, son. <laughs> now, even Lisa Simpson must agree that we have witnessed a miracle. <laughs> Hardly. Anyone could have written that. Oh, Angel, listen not to this child of Satan. <laughs> and it's funny because there's... His own daughter. He told Lisa earlier that, that the word angel was a typo, and in the script on that word, they actually have angel typed wrong where it says angle. Uh, I, there's actually been several <laughs> <funny>. <laughs> There's actually been several places on the script that it's been angle, I've already noticed, but I'm glad you called it out, <laughs> frankly. It's, it needed to be done. <laughs> so everybody at this point feels like their beliefs have been – justified that they that they're clearly correct because obviously some sort of god power is happening to make all of this happen but uh word actually gets all the way to the pope <laughs> your holiness is... there is word from america they say an angel has forbid the apoc or foretold the apocalypse yeah uh, keep an eye on it <laughs> obviously it's not really registering on a global scale I like that word reached them so fast in, like, pre-cell phone Wi-Fi days. Yeah, they had to actually send, like, a dude to the Pope. That's true. (laughs) Uh, Everybody in town is pretty much resolved the fact that they are very close to the end of days, whatever that might mean. Uh, Edna is giving Skinner quite the offer to go have a farewell romp in the Garden of Earthly Delights. Is that the janitor's closet? <laughs> oh, Edna, my buttercup, you read my mind. Just give me 20 minutes or so to finish these tardy slips. <laughs> He's still doing his job even when he thinks it's ending. Yep. Marge is making the family get dressed up in their fanciest clothes and everybody's complaining. Bart's just confused. What, are we going to Black Angus or something, Mom? Well... You might say we're going to the best steakhouse in the whole universe. Oh, so we're not going to Black Angus. (laughs) 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 They talked about this joke on the commentary and how much they just get a kick out of the fact that uh, the if like the CEO of this company was watching the first time you hear it, you're going to be like, oh, my God, that's so awesome. We got mentioned on The Simpsons. And then like 20 (laughs) seconds later, you're going to be like, oh, (laughs) (laughs) so lisa is getting more and more frustrated with her mom because her mom's trying to get her all like made up and like i said looking like her sunday best so to speak but lisa's just mad will you leave me alone it's bad enough you're making me go to your stupid judgment day please lisa i don't know exactly what's gonna happen but i really wish we could make peace before sunset Nothing's going to happen, Mom. I hate to disappoint you, but the world is not coming to an end. And this Uh-oh. is that moment I was talking about earlier where you can really see the pain in Marge's eyes and face on this one. Like the animation just sends such a, a strong message and uh really just you like I said, you feel for Marge so much right here. I and feel acting performances are so wonderful. What were you going to say, Rich? I was going to say, I feel like the adults in Springfield, which is true to form, are doing a terrible job because, like, the, all these children were there and know what's about to happen. And, like, everyone's kind of panicky right now. And it just, like, it, it always bothers me that they're not more like everything's going to be okay, even if they feel like it's truly not, and trying to, like, keep a certain calm about them. But that's that's Springfield for you. Like, uh, like Sonny said, mob, mob mentality for the most part. So Yeah, there's a reason that they constantly are forming together. <laughs> and it makes for better TV. For sure. <laughs> mm-hmm. They actually all gather around the angel up on the hill, and Ned suggests that they sing a hymn, but I love Re- uh, Reverend Lovejoy's like, mm, nah. <laughs> all right. Now, before we get to this part, 
let's be honest, guys. The first time you saw this and the angel started speaking, what were your thoughts? Like, Ooh, like wow. the first time I saw this and the angel started talking, I was like, it's kind of foot because there's that split second where you're like, oh, my gosh, like something actually is happening. But then when it starts talking, you're like, this thing sounds like a ridiculous human. So like, but there's that split second where something starts to happen where you're like, holy crap, what's going on? That's how I felt the first time I saw this episode. I, I very vividly remember it. That's a good question. I don't know that I vividly remember it. What about you, Sonny? Oh, I, I, I wish I did. I know that I, I every time, like, oh, I freeze up at it, but first like, time. Yep. I would say that because of the fact that, one, I've established I was a stupid kid, and two, the Simpsons established that God did exist in this universe. I mean, we've seen him physically to some extent, uh, like Homer the Heretic, for instance. Mostly just with Homer, though. Mostly just with Homer, that's fair. But I would say that I probably thought it was actually the voice of God. Hmm. But I don't really know. I, I, I don't have that vivid memory like you do. That's interesting that you... Uh, that this impacted you so much, though. It's, There's that's just that split second where know. you thought it might be real, like right as it happens. It, I mean, and you kind of get that when you rewatch it, too. Like, Bro, it kind of sucks. You need something to believe in. That's all you, man. You do you, boo. <laughs> 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 uh, but yeah, the the statue does start to talk. You're not wrong. That's exactly what happened. I do like, though, uh, before it does, Marge is actually, or I'm sorry, Homer is holding tightly onto Marge's hand and telling her, pleading with her, not to let go no matter what, because <laughs> if they want you in heaven, they're going to have to take me too. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good choice there, Homer. I don't know, man. There's a fine line there. On one hand, you could argue that he's so sweet and loves his wife so much and knows that she's like, you know, go, like if they were going to take anyone, it would be her type of thing. Uh, but on the other hand, it's like, dude, you might end up dragging your wife who you cherish to hell with you. <laughs> you just want him to pull up. This is the end where he's like, you need to go. That's where you belong. And the fact that he lets her go gets him into heaven. That's what you're going with. Oh, I didn't think about that at all, actually. But okay. sure, we'll go actually, with that. I I think they did do something like that. It made probably a treehouse uh, where they're all getting pulled to heaven, and he's weighing them down. Yeah, I think you might be right. I, I you know what? Also, I feel like I could be confusing that with the UFO. Oh, uh, that might be up. it. Yeah, well, there's one where where Judgment Day actually comes and like Marge is down there with them and like the Flanders and everyone else are getting up into heaven and they're all just stuck down there, like sitting on a car in a river of blood or something. Hmm. I don't know. I do know though, sunset is upon us. They actually do a countdown and the sun falls over the horizon and absolutely nothing happens. Uh, um, and that's when Lisa Patty and Selma. Oh Patty my and god, Selma yes. beat cancer. <laughs> Patty and Selma are the best they beat here. Cancer. And Smithers, hello. I totally passed over. That's a very important part. Smithers decides what's the hell and gives Mr. Burns a big old smooch. Uh, right Patty on the and mouth. Selma are smoking their uh, cigarettes, and yeah, they kind of cheers each other as they beat cancer. Huh. Well, we beat cancer. <laughs> That's one way to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good joke, too. Um,. But yeah, nothing else happens. I'm sorry. Like, no big event. And Lisa's about to be smitten as can be. And you can tell that she's about to give a big old lecture about how stupid you are for believing that angels could be possibly real when a unearthly voice speaks out. Silence. Prepare for the end. The end of high prices. Behold the grand opening of the Heavenly Hills Mall. But, like, the buildup on that was definitely, like, the first silence and then the prepare for the end. The angel yes. actually, like, rises up and begins to float. And the townspeople are losing their mind. And Lisa herself is clutching to her mother uh, in a way that we have not seen all episode because they've had that friction and that tension. Um, but now you can see that in that moment of fear, that's exactly who she latches onto. Uh, but yeah, then it very clearly becomes like some sort of stupid marketing ploy. And that's exactly what really gets under. Well, first of all, that's exactly what it would be in real life. So that's really funny. Uh, but then Lisa is pissed. I mean, as you can imagine, wait a second, you planted a phony skeleton for me to find. 
This was all just a hoax? Not a hoax. A publicity stunt. But you exploited people's deepest beliefs just to anoint your cheesy wares? We're outraged, aren't we? <laughs> oh, yeah. We're outraged. Very much so. But look at all the stores! A pottery barn! Yeah, and 20% off of everything! Does that include the rat spray? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and this is where you're talking about Agnes literally pushes people out of her way. Uh, Lisa included. Out of my way, shorty! Got the feet of a 20-year-old. So, Lisa is... <laughs> Lisa's uh, confused, and she's talking to Dr. Gould, who explains that the reason that the test didn't show that the skeleton was fake is because he uh, never actually did the test. And then just walks away. <laughs> <laughs> no explanation. It ties it all together. Mr. Burns and uh, Smithers have a moment where Smithers opens the door for Burns. Um, sir, uh, about that kiss, I, I hope you understand that it was um, merely a sign of respect. Yes, yes, of course. But there's a look in Mr. Burns's eye here that makes you think maybe that's not the belie- or not what he was hoping for. <laughs> and this is where we get the the big heartfelt moment of the episode between Lisa and Marge. Well, I guess you were right, honey, but you have to admit that when the angel started to talk, you were squeezing my hand pretty hard. <laughs> Well, it was just so loud, and thanks for squeezing back. Any time, my angel. And they actually walk off into the sunset holding hands, and that line, that uh, any time, my angel, is so perfect, because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the double mm -hmm. meaning of the, like, everything about it is just so, so well written and so beautiful, and uh, definitely makes me understand, Sonny, why you chose this episode to join us on for Best Darn Diddly. And we are so glad that you did join us uh, today. Thank you for being here and being a part of the podcast and discussing this wonderful episode. Uh, is there anything else about Lisa the Skeptic that you would like to share? Oh, my God. Uh, I, I had a lot of notes. I think I crammed everything <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for having me. Oh, this yeah. It's been so much fun. I'm so glad uh, we got a chance. It's so much fun when we get to just talk to passionate fans and hear other people's perspective of why they're connected to this show that we love. So we're, we're so glad you're here. And uh, Richie, before we bail out, how about you, sir? Is there anything that you wanted to add for Lisa the Skeptic? Yeah, I forgot to talk about it when the angel was in the garage, but when Homer hung up the sign, you can see see he like nailed the sign into the freaking wall in the garage, and there are cracks forming where he nailed it. So I don't know, that just stood out to me, and I was like, uh, the, the the cracks really sell how cheaply Homer did it. But other than that, I I freaking really enjoy this episode, like especially when we go seasons past talking about Lisa centric episodes and how we appreciate them more as adults but like this one i always very much enjoyed and a lot of it is because you you get those feelings that i already brought up like especially when the angel yells silence that split second that i was talking about earlier right there so i think there's a lot of intrigue in this one even when you know how it's going to end after seeing it for like the hundredth time it still gives you that feeling of like inquisitiveness and astonishment that i referenced earlier so yeah fun episode yeah the way that they leave you feeling after the voice chimes in is definitely just like the way that they've built the tension the whole time. So when you do hear the voice, you're like, Oh my God, wait, literally maybe, I don't know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I talked about it at the beginning of the episode a little bit that David uh, Cohen had an interesting bit about the end and really um, more than anything he had, I'm going to talk about his approach to this entire episode because I don't know how true this story is, but it's from the commentary, and I love it, so I hope it's true. And I also always believe you should never let the truth get in the way of a good story. So David Cohen said that he actually thought up this idea while he was visiting a museum with his family. I want to say it was the New York Science Museum. Uh, it was not really anything other than just a family visit, and they went there you know, as an activity together. Uh, but it was on the plane ride home that he realized that he had an idea for a script, and if he jotted it down and at least got an outline going on the plane, he could expense that as a business trip. 
<laughs> and that's where nice. this came on the uh, on the ride home from uh, or the flight home from New York. And he also went on to say that he is uh, definitely pro on science, team science on this one. He is an atheist, and he uh, he talked about how in the original ending, he definitely gave Lisa a little bit more of a win, so to speak. Like she kind of got to be like kind of uh, rubbing it in their faces a little bit, and kind of got that almost uh, fantasy type of ending for his perspective. But he realized, and and collectively he said they realized, like, yeah, that's not really going to land as well for a lot of audience. And the idea of making it a little bit more neutral uh, and leaving that topic that is such a heated debate. I mean, one of the majors, you don't talk about uh, religion and you don't talk about politics, they say, if you want to, like, keep friends or whatever. And, uh, like, to kind of give that more of a neutral ending where there isn't necessarily a clear-cut winner between science and religion. So I just thought that was an interesting tale from the commentary. That's so great, too, because the Simpsons writers do this a lot. Like, even maybe not as much neutral with the NRA episode because they kind of painted them a little too nice. But, like, they do a good job of of not declaring a clear-cut winner. Like, yes, Lisa won in the end on this one. But Marge also won because she got to have that moment with her daughter and they, and they tied up that loose end. And like <laughs> we're all children in, in retrospect in the real world where we all just won our way and we don't ever really have a good middle ground to go on. But yet these writers each and every week find a way to write themselves into like a compromise that's good for both parties constantly on this show. And maybe we all need to be more like Simpsons writers. Who knows? <laughs> WWSWD. <laughs> <laughs> we'll make bracelets. All right. Uh, once again, thank you so much to Sonny Allison. Thank you to everybody who downloaded this podcast and shared it, told friends, donate on Patreon, all the podcasty things. We appreciate you so much. Uh, Sonny, uh, you're on Instagram for sure. Do you want to plug uh, where people can reach out and talk to you about The Simpsons if they'd like to? Ooh, um... You don't have to. <laughs> I'm really not yeah. All right. Don't talk to Sunny. She loved being here, but she does not have any desire to talk to you. But you can talk to us and we'll relay the message. She's a, a lovely person. She's just not on social media. Uh, we are. I'm at Mr. Most Days Off. Richie is at the Wiz underscore kid 23. And you can follow the show at Best Darn Diddly. That's D I D D L Y. Do make sure you come back again next week because we're talking about an episode that we already talked about. I don't remember what the order was. Uh, is it? Is it going from there to there? I thought that was two away for some reason. Maybe not. All right. So Realty Bites is the next episode we'll be come, uh, talking about. So make sure you come back and join us next week. Oh, wait. The murder house? Miles, I'm scared. Too scared to even wet my pants. Just relax, Richie. It'll come. And until next time, be cromulent to each other.